In their simplest definition, archangels are believed to be chief angels, those that sit atop the angelic hierarchy in terms of their closeness to God and their powers and abilities. But contrary to popular belief, only one angel is specifically named in the Bible as an archangel, and this is Michael. We know Michael is suggested as the angel who guards over Israel, according to the book of Daniel, and we know Michael is the angel who leads the heavenly host against Lucifer in the great celestial battle in the book of Revelation. But others consider a second angel in Gabriel as an archangel too, despite not actually being named as one in the Bible. In several exegesis and apocrypha, we see Gabriel identified as a messenger angel, something we see him do quite often throughout the Bible, and we also see him identified as an archangel in these apocryphal texts too, along with the likes of Raphael and Uriel, those who are also not specifically mentioned in the Bible. When we consider the Book of Enoch for example, an ancient Hebrew apocalyptic text, several angels including Gabriel, Uriel, Raphael, Raguel, Sariel, Phanuel, and even Metatron are attributed as being archangels. So why does the church only recognize Michael when these angels do appear to be archangels, according to ancient Judaic tradition? Well, it's possible that the church deemed it necessary to streamline the Bible and remove the more fanciful interpretations that were not congruent with the canonical scripture. Therefore, veneration of any angels outside of Michael and Gabriel in some religious communities was technically impermissible. It's also true that heterodox practices and pagan traditions saw people and communities come to idolize angels more than they did God, perhaps on the account that it was the archangels who were seen bringing salvation according to ancient texts, and perhaps on the account that the archangels were humanized through art. With the increase of favoritism towards the divine messengers, it gave the church more reason not to acknowledge archangels in any significant way, at least outside of Michael. As far as more conservative Christianity goes, it is forbidden to teach or even acknowledge the archangels' names, their functions, and their characters outside of what is specifically mentioned in the Holy Scriptures. But alas, doesn't that just make them all the more tantalizing? In spite of these rules set down by the church, it has not stopped people from seeing signs of the archangels, or if you look in the comments below, people actually meeting them, or at least seeing them in dreams, or even being spirited away to some otherworldly plane. In short, people really do believe in archangels, despite the church's warnings, and people do appear to experience the same kind of phenomena, such as seeing certain colors, numbers, or even hearing voices. In today's episode then, we'll be diving into this a little more, and trying to understand what signs are associated with which archangel, what these signs mean, and whether these signs have any correlation to the Bible or apocryphal texts. On a side note, it should be noted that I do not necessarily see a concrete connection between these signs and the archangels. None of these signs are confirmed in any scripture, nor any apocryphal text that I could find. Therefore, it is a mystery as to where these signs originally came from, and it is possible that they have simply spread via word of mouth. Again, these signs are by no means doctrine. They are simply the most frequent signs I've heard associated with the archangels and purported archangel sightings. Basically, just have fun with today's video, and remember, it's okay for people to have different beliefs, even if the ideas presented in today's episode might seem outlandish or otherwise incongruent with one's own beliefs. Archangel Michael We know that the concept of Michael being a chief angel comes from the Old Testament, where in chapter 10 of Daniel, we see him referred to as a chief prince. We also see him described specifically as an archangel in some translations of the New Testament, where in Jude chapter 9, he is spoken of as arguing with Satan over the body of Moses. Chapter 10 of the book of Daniel also tells us that Archangel Michael assists God in his efforts to defeat the prince of Persia. We are told, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. 
but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. However, some consider the fact that the biblical God would have had no need of assistance when overcoming the Persian prince. And so, it has been argued that the entity here in Daniel's vision is not God, but instead another angelic presence. In any case, this entity, be it God or be it another angel, paints Michael in a heroic light, an archangel who is strong enough to turn the tide of battle. Daniel makes a second note of Michael in chapter 12 of his book, where we are told, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. From this, we can gather that Michael is indeed a protector over the Israelites particularly those whose names are found written in the book, or those who are righteous. In this sense, Michael is not just a hero, but also a guardian, and does indeed have some responsibility when it comes to taking care of mortals. In John's Apocalypse, meanwhile, found in the book of Revelation, we are told of the Great War of Heaven, where Michael fights Satan in his dragon form. It is said, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Once more, Michael is portrayed as the hero, the vanquisher of evil, the ultimate evil, if you will. It is interesting then that the Bible doesn't have that much to really say about Michael outside of these passages, and that Michael, despite his defeat of Satan, is something of an unsung hero. Perhaps this is what makes him so popular, and what may frustrate certain curiosity about him. His elusiveness after these accounts only have the effect of making him more sought after, and it's easy to see why some people long to meet him, to perhaps pay homage, offer gratitudes, or just bask in his reputed glory. But if Archangel Michael is a subtle creature who commands very little attention as far as the Bible goes, perhaps his presence upon the earth is just as subtle, hence why his presence can only be identified by various signs. As Daniel once beheld a vision that detailed the distressing fate of Israel, Archangel Michael is believed to visit those who are experiencing negativity or having difficulty accepting or understanding a certain truth, just like Daniel. In some cases, it is purported that Michael leaves physical signs to notify a person that he is with them. This can include moving things around, causing leaves to fall from trees, or even moving feathers into a place where someone will find them. In other cases, these signs can be tailored to the individual person, where objects, or the arrangement of objects, can indicate the presence of the Archangel. Others purport hearing voices, maybe not the sort of voices that require clinical support, but perhaps a strong intuition, an inner voice if you will. We might just chalk this up to our own inner voice, but those who have allegedly heard the voice of the angel determine that it is so strong and so clear that it is undeniably the Archangel Michael. The voice can be blunt, but it can also come in the form of a gut feeling, warding people away from certain dangers. One may feel tingly sensations, those that might be akin to ASMR, and these can leave the receiver feeling positive, loved, and also at peace. Once more a nod to Archangel Michael's efforts to protect the righteous as he is seen to do over Israel. Aside from these signs, the receiver might also see bursts of blue or purple light. A more controversial idea is that if a person happens to come into contact with several people named Michael, or they keep seeing the name Michael, this is also a sign that the Archangel Michael is present. Archangel Gabriel Much like Archangel Michael, Gabriel is even more guilty of being in absentia in the pages of scripture. 
We do see him appear in the Gospel of Luke before the priest Zechariah, where Gabriel tells the priest that he and his wife will give birth to a son named John, who would become John the Baptist. Unfortunately, even in this passage, Gabriel, despite introducing himself as such, is not identified as an archangel. Many know of Gabriel as being a messenger angel, and he conforms to his reputation here as he delivers the prophecy to Zechariah that despite his old age, he and his elderly wife will have a son. Despite beholding the incredible form of the angel in the flesh, Zechariah does not believe the words he hears. We are told, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. With this, he is answered. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. As we can see, Gabriel fulfills his role as a messenger, but he's not without wrath. As Zechariah expresses doubt over the angel's words, it is not beyond Gabriel to punish Zechariah, which he does so almost casually by taking away his ability to speak. From this, we can gather that though the angels might be a sign of incredible fortitude and good tidings, they are also harsh and should not be reckoned with. We also see in the Gospel of Luke that Gabriel is sent by God to Nazareth and that he is instructed to seek out the Virgin Mary and reveal to her that she is blessed. When Mary is discomforted by the sudden appearance of the angel, Gabriel provides her with comfort and relief as we are told, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Despite his apparent harshness with Zechariah, Gabriel comforts Mary, despite her being troubled by his words. This might be because unlike Zechariah, who simply didn't believe he could have a child because of his age, Mary is just simply confused. There's also an idea that because of how different each character is treated, Gabriel may show some favoritism towards women, or at least women in distress, which may translate to a more modern interpretation of the angel. In the Old Testament, specifically the book of Daniel, we do see Gabriel choose not to spare Daniel of the immensity of his presence. Gabriel strikes such fear into Daniel that the man falls down on his knees and prostrates before the angel, whilst remarking that he was terrified. As is the case in the New Testament, Gabriel is sent to Daniel to grant him a vision of the things to come. But after receiving the vision, Daniel is not shown the same compassion or comforts that are offered to Mary. Instead, he is left exhausted for several days. As we've seen from the biblical accounts, Gabriel, as a messenger, is believed to represent communication and expression. As you might imagine, the angel can help with one's inability to find their authentic voice, or perhaps to assist someone in delivering a specific set of important instructions, whether this be for work or one's own personal life. Gabriel can also be called upon to help with communication problems in a relationship, as well as aiding couples in finding the right things to say and finding healthy ways in which to express themselves. As Gabriel takes away Zachariah's expression in the Gospel of Luke, Gabriel might also take away negative expression and or prevent a person from speaking without thinking. Some purport to see either bright white lights or bright copper lights. This might be taken from the fact that Gabriel is depicted in various artwork as holding lilies, which are white, or holding a trumpet, which is close enough to be copper colored. The white light may also be representative of Gabriel's purity, in that the angel seeks to cleanse the spirit of the person he visits. Furthermore, considering that the archangel is depicted in classical artwork as holding a trumpet, it can be said that if one sees a trumpet, or hears the sound of a trumpet more often than usual, then this might be a sign that Gabriel is near. In the same sense that someone might start seeing the name Michael more frequently, they might also see the name Gabriel more often, 
which signifies another indication that Gabriel is present, or trying to leave a message. Archangel Raphael Contrary to popular belief, the Archangel Raphael does not appear in the Holy Scriptures. Instead, we must look to the apocryphal book of Tobias, a 3rd century Jewish work that sees the Archangel sent by God to accompany Tobias on his journey to Ecbatana. When Tobias arrives at Ecbatana, he meets a woman named Sarah and falls in love with her. However, their love is forbidden because Sarah reveals that every time she takes a husband, the demon Asmodeus kills her husband before the marriage can be consummated. Raphael advises Tobias that by using the body parts of a fish, notably the heart, the liver, and the gall, they can drive Asmodeus away. After burning these parts of the fish, Tobias is victorious, and Raphael chases the demon away. Additionally, Raphael is instrumental in healing Tobias's father by instructing him to rub the fish gall into his father's eyes, which has the magical effect of restoring his father's sight. Similarly, in the Testament of Solomon, a pseudepigraphical book from the early 1st century, the demon Asmodeus is seen revealing to Solomon that of all the angels that frustrate him, it is Raphael who frustrates him the most, and so we are led to believe that the two are arch nemeses. With Archangel Raphael demonstrating his healing powers with Tobias' father, it's easy to see why he is regarded as a healing angel. Additionally, his name Raphael, when we consider the original Hebrew, is meant to mean healing, or to heal. With this in mind, many today therefore believe that Archangel Raphael can be called upon during times of both physical or emotional recuperation. Some have purported seeing the flashing of emerald green lights, or that the reoccurring sight of the colour green is a good indication that the Archangel is near. This might be deduced by the fact that green is closely associated with nature, as well as the healing benefits that are said to come when being amongst nature. As is the case with the previous Archangels, frequently seeing the name Raphael is believed to be a good indication that the Archangel is present, or perhaps trying to convey a message. Lucid dreaming, or dreams about angels, are also believed to be a sign that the Archangel is with a person, and that the dream may be a means by which Raphael is trying to communicate. All these signs might be a good indication that a person who is suffering with pain might soon find some relief, as Tobias's father found relief when his sight was restored. Archangel Uriel We see Archangel Uriel mentioned by name in the Book of Enoch, an ancient apocalyptic text of Hebrew origin. In this text, Uriel appears alongside Michael, Gabriel and Raphael, and the four are dispatched by God to destroy the Nephilim, that had been produced between the Watchers, who were essentially fallen angels, and the mortal women, who they seduced. Uriel has a specific task, however, as he is instructed to find Noah, and told to tell him to hide himself. This is because God ultimately ends up flooding the world to eradicate the last vestiges of Nephilim that managed to escape, and because he wants Noah, of all the people, to survive. Uriel in this sense can be seen similarly to Michael, a saviour of the righteous, and one who can bring protection and good tidings. In other interpretations, Uriel is believed to be the angel who stands guard at the gates of Eden, where he wields a flaming sword to ward away any who come to paradise too early. As Michael stands guard over Israel, Uriel too can also therefore be seen as a god or a means to ensure security over a place or people. Some signs of the Archangel Uriel include suddenly being motivated to help others. This might link back to Uriel's motivations to help Noah, and though he is commanded by God to do so, he does fulfil his duty in hiding Noah successfully. Furthermore, Archangel Uriel takes it upon himself to guide Enoch through the various planes of existence, including Hell itself, the prison of the fallen angels, and the heavenly realms. God does not appear to command Uriel to do this in the Book of Enoch, but rather the angel takes it upon himself to ensure Enoch does not get lost. With that, 
the sudden urge to help others could be attributed to Uriel being present, whereby the angel would not only encourage such generosity, but also help facilitate it. The colour red has also been attributed with the Archangel Uriel, though there does not appear to be a specific reason that I could find to really warrant this. Furthermore, it is purported that sparks of electricity can also be linked to the Archangel Uriel, and that these are physical manifestations for the sparks of one's mind suddenly brimming with fresh ideas. Archangel Jophiel In the pseudepigraphical text known as the Revelation of Moses, Jophiel, who also appears as Dina, is believed to be an angel of judgement. In this text, she is a guardian of the Torah, who taught 70 languages to various souls at the dawn of creation. The Zohar, meanwhile, describes her as a great chief angel, one who commands 53 legions of workers that facilitate the reading of the Torah on the Sabbath. Going by angelic tradition, however, Jophiel is the archangel of wisdom, art and beauty, that which sees her often depicted as a woman. Like Uriel, she can also be depicted as wielding a flaming sword, though whether this is used to protect or to judge is not really known. Biblically speaking, Jophiel is one of the far removed angels, and thus, there is very little credible information about her. John Milton's Paradise Lost, a fictional work of angels and demons, does refer to Jophiel as a cherub, but to be honest, it would seem that his guess at the angel's true likeness is as good as ours. In any case, this has not stopped many from sensing signs of Jophiel, those that include helping one study, allowing one to grow mentally, and to broaden narrow minds. With her reputation as being an angel of wisdom and beauty, she has also been believed to inspire artistic thought. With angels believed to be living in another plane of existence, perhaps existing in higher vibrational frequencies, it has been deemed impossible to physically see them. Well, considering that many of these angels scare the daylights out of biblical characters and take some questionable forms, it's likely you'd probably never want to see one anyway. But in the case of the lesser known angels like Jophiel, it is purported that they are always here for humanity, and in this, they can be linked to certain colours, gemstones, or even numbers. In the case of Jophiel, the number 3 has been suggested as representing this angel, because according to the study of numerology, all numbers have a certain vibration that contains within them a certain power. Therefore, if one is to see the number 3 recurrently, it's possible that they are getting a sign from Jophiel, particularly in times of growth or learning new things. Numbers 33, 333 or 3033 can also signify the presence of Jophiel, according to these beliefs. Much like the previous angels, Jophiel can be identified by a specific colour, the colour yellow. This might be because of her flaming sword producing yellow flame, but it could also be representative of sunlight, and that Jophiel shines light on darkness, revealing knowledge that was otherwise hidden. Azrael Believed to be the angel of death, namely in the religion of Islam, Azrael is said to ferry the souls of the deceased to meet their maker. As told to us in the Quran, in Surah as sajdar your soul will be taken by the angel of death, who is in charge of you. Then to your lord, you will all be returned. In other accounts, including those in Judaism, Azrael is believed to hold a scroll that contains the fate of each individual mortal. When a person dies, he erases their name from the scroll, eternally replacing them with names of the recently born. I suppose it becomes pretty obvious that a clear-cut sign of the angel of death would be, well, death. But some argue that Azrael does more than just transport souls of the dead to meet their maker, but instead helps the loved ones of those who have died process their grief. Instead of fearing him, many of this belief choose to see Azrael as more like a nurse, who prepares the dying for the inevitable. There aren't many purported signs of Azrael beyond this. I've seen in my comment section that people have associated this angel to white light, or that in some accounts of near-death experiences, people have seen a white light. 
With this, it might be said that the continuous experience of white light may be a sign that Archangel Azrael is on the prowl. But indeed, this clashes with the ideas that Archangel Uriel can also be signified by a white light. As can be gathered from this video, beyond the likes of Michael and Gabriel, information about Archangels becomes scarcer and scarcer. You might have noticed that I chose to omit the likes of Archangel Fanuel, Ramiel, and Raguel, amongst others, simply because of the lack of credible detail that's available. In even apocryphal texts and non-canonical works, these angels do not get substantial mentions, and therefore, it becomes harder and harder to really determine who they were, let alone what their signs are. From my understanding of these ideas, the archangels appear to show themselves through a particular set of colours, numbers, patterns, or even crystals. But once more, much of this information cannot be linked with scripture. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a like, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.